each of the plots as well has different shocks or different uh, so each of those also have been identified uh, and this is all the way to the farms uh, and uh, areas of social gathering uh, have been identified as well by scanning the area so every single if you wanna if you go to gaps and wanna know where the best bar is just let me know and I'll just uh, tell you exactly uh, with the map where where is it located um, so sorry it took too long oh, this is this is the last one <laughs> because we didn't have the last we, did, we didn't have a lab uh, we needed to come up with one so this is a, a, a BSL 3 um, lab uh, that uh, um, has actually two hoods and uh, this is uh, this has double the TB uh, culture capacity of the nation so and is right now being used exclusively for uh, research and I am sh shutting up <laughs> all right we have time for one last question Rob. is there enough sequence diversity in, in TB within a human population to be able to use the genotyping to confirm the contact tracing uh, that is that is a very good question, and that is the main question in areas with a high uh, a TB prevalence. And the answer is I don't know. Uh, we have started uh, rolling uh, TB uh, uh, cases about two months ago, and uh, we have just shipped the same the first uh, set of samples. Um, give me six months, and I'll give you a better idea. But uh, but that is that is key. That how is key. Are, how are you genotyping? Uh, it's 24 loci uh, in yeah. my room. But we are collecting, we are storing sputum, if you want to, for, for mixing factions so that you can PCR it. And we're collecting a separate sample for uh, whole genome uh, sequencing for when uh, NIH give us one money. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next is Tracy Rosebrock from uh, Harvard University. Oh. <laughs> she is going to uh, talk about uh, the effect of HIV on MTB and macrophages. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you everybody for having me here. I'm really excited to tell you about my work with Sarah Fortune, um, dissecting the effect of HIV on MTB growth and macrophages using a single cell approach. I think I'm going to have some PC Mac issues, I've just noticed, so I apologize for that right now. Um, so our work was really born from the epidemiological observation that the risk for pulmonary tuberculosis occurs early in HIV infection before other opportunistic infections when CD4 counts are relatively normal and viral load is considered low. We and others postulated that in addition to the effects of HIV on the adaptive immune system, HIV may be disrupting innate immune mechanisms that allow MTB to grow uncontrollably inside a macrophage, possibly. So we know that um, the primary replicative niche for TB is the alveolar macrophage, and we also know that these cells support HIV. And so one simple possibility is that HIV disrupts the macrophage control of TB replication. So we wanted to explore that. We built an in vitro macrophage co-infection model with the help of Marcus Altfeld at the Reagan Institute and CIFAR funding. And, uh, and there, our goal was really to be able to assess HIV burden and TB burden in individual cells. This is how we set up our model. We take uh, blood-derived monocytes from individual donors. We divide the pool of cells in half. We infect one half with virulent HIV. We wait about two weeks. That's about how long it takes to get a robust infection for us to be able to detect it with our tools. We then infect with virulent TB, and then we quantify TB burden over time. So this is what it looks like at our, what our experiment looks like at the bulk population level. We monitored MTB burden in cultures that were infected with TB only, and compared that burden to TB cultures that were infected with HIV as well. And we found that co-infected cultures support a higher burden of TB growth. Um, but this population level assessment um, probably mask subpopulation dynamics. And we speculated that these, this co-infected population probably co is comprised of co-infected macrophages 
that have HIV and TB and bystander macrophages. And our definition here is TB infected macrophages that are in the co-infected culture that, are ex that only have TB, no HIV, but are exposed to some kind of uh, HIV induced extracellular change. Okay, so uh, we developed method methodologies to use Thornton's microscopy to sort of dissect these two subpopulations. Uh, we can then, so you can see here we have co-infected, I'm sorry, I don't have a clinical pointer, but we had co-infected cells and bystander cells here. Oh, thank you. Uh, this way. Oh. Oh, anyway, okay. Co-infected and bystander cells, and um, we could then use, quantify, it's okay. Oh. Thank you. We could then quantify um, both HIV burden and TB burden using fluorescence signal as a proxy. So we then quantified the median from basically hundreds of individual macrophages from each of these populations, and we compared those medians over time. And we found that the co-infected cells are really the cells that are supporting a higher burden of TB that we, that we observed at the population level. And that the effect of HIV really wasn't spreading into um, the bystander cells, because in most of the donors that we tested, the bystander cells were not, didn't carry a significantly, high, uh, a significantly different burden of TB than the control cells, which were TB infected only and not exposed to HIV. From here, we really wanted to dig a little bit deeper into the effect of HIV on, um, in co-infected cells. And as we know, or we suspect in the TB field, that TB really moves between an active state and a quiescent state during infection. And so we wanted to capitalize on that. And with the help of a collaborator at Northeastern, Iris Cairn, we developed a macrophage assay using a transcriptional reporter a strain of MTB. And so I'm just going to walk you through the strain quickly and how we interpret our data. So the strain um, constitutively expresses a red floor floor, and that tells us that the bacteria is present inside the macrophage. And then if we, um, it also has an inducible GFP signal or green signal. So if we add an inducer and the bacterium is transcriptionally active, you'll have both red and green signal coming from that bacterium. And then you can quantify the proportion of active TB within, an, within a macrophage. And from there, you can infer macrophage function. So from, uh, for our point of view, if a macrophage is harboring greater than 50% active TB, we consider that macrophage should be permissive of TB infection. And if that macrophage is carrying less than 50%, we consider it to be restrictive of TB infection. So first I'll, wa I'll walk you through what we saw with our MTB infected macrophages that, oh my gosh, these are so bad. <laughs> um, with our, H our control macrophages were MTB only that do not have HIV. And you can see what the point I want to make here is that there's a large, uh, large phenotypic spectrum of our macrophages. So there's clearly macrophages that are uh, permissive of MTB, which are up here, although they can't read it, and macrophages that are restrictive of TB, which are down here. And this horizontal line here represents median, and each dot is data from individual macrophages. So we're currently trying to understand what this if this phenotypic spectrum is reflective of a truly functional spectrum and what the macrophage contribution and the bacterial contribution is to placement within, within that spectrum. If we use the same approach and look at what happens with co-infected cells, we saw some really interesting results. First, the co-infected cells are clearly skewed towards a permissive state where you have a much higher median of, of or per median proportion of active TB. But this was really what, um, what surprised us the most, which was that we would expect in the co-infected cells you'd have more transcriptionally active bacteria because you had a higher burden. We saw that already. But in the bystanders, we didn't see a higher burden. These cells um, looked pretty much like the MTB only. But if you see here, the, the TB inside these cells are transcriptionally active. And so we think this means that there's really two effects of HIV on the macrophage population. One is a cell non-autonomous effect where HIV is allowing transcription to occur. And the second is a cell autonomous effect, which only occurs in the co-infected macrophage that somehow relieves a restriction on MTB replicating. Okay, so these data are really exciting because they start to explore how the intrinsic, intrinsic controls of um, macrophages have against TB, um, but we know that the infection picture is more complicated than that. We know that there are exogenous signals that, um, that help macrophages control TB, and one of the um, exogenous signals that have come out in the last five to ten years as being primarily important is vitamin D. We know that that elicits bacterial cytal activity against TB and macrophages. And so we wanted to know, how does HIV affect vitamin D responsiveness? 
And this is, again, a single cell data. I'm showing you the median burden, and these are our control cells, M to be infected, not exposed to HIV. And you can see median burden from day one to day five increases significantly. However, that increase in, in burden does not occur in the presence of vitamin D. And if we look at the co-infected and bystander cells, we see that the increase, uh, increase in burden without vitamin D, and there's an increase in burden with vitamin D. And there's perhaps um, less growth in the presence of vitamin D, and that might be really good news for us, people that are interested in curing this disease. But sort of the sadder part of this was that when we looked at the transcriptional state of these TB within these cells, we saw that although there's a clearer reduction of transcriptional activity in the control cells indicating that vitamin D may be indeed helping macrophages to kill TB, we were unable to detect any such effect in the co-infected and the bystander cells. And so really our data is helping us to um, see that HIV has both had its intrin um, disrupts intrinsic controls of the macrophage on, against MTB and exogenous controls um, of the macrophage against MTB, and it's helping us to sort of put at least one piece of the puzzle in to explain why um, patients with HIV have TB a risk occurring earlier than other opportunistic infections, and that would be the role of the macrophage. This is really just scratching the surface for this project, and we have a lot of questions that we'd like to answer now, and if anybody has ideas, please please talk to me about it, because I, I love um, input from the field. The first is, what is the mechanism by which alter, HIV alters macrophage control of MTB in all of these different manners? And there could be m many different kinds of mechanisms. What is the mechanism by which HIV alters vitamin D responsiveness? What are the viral determinants of these effects? And lastly, which I didn't really have time to talk about the data for, but how does antiretroviral treatment alter the effects of HIV? Because we have some inkling that maybe HIV terminally um, changes the macrophage to a permissive state, and we really like to understand how heart plays into that. Um, this was a collaborative effort across Boston and institutions and actually across the country, and these are all the people I like to thank, especially Sarah, she's been a tremendous mentor, and um, funding from the Harvard CIFAR and the NIH. Thank you. Hi, Jody. Hi, that was really nice. I'm wondering, I know, I mean, I don't I know in the early days of HIV, there was this distinction between macrophage trophic and T-cell trophic viruses, and I know that's much more, much less prevalent now. How much do you think the macrophage infection of HIV is occurring in the whole in HIV patients? So, um, I, and Sarah and I are really <coughs> interested in that question, yeah. and trying to dig, dig deep into figuring out exactly that and um, and so really the literature is kind of poor I think that's a huge area that is underexplored and we really need to know more um, so there's sort of sort of runs the gamut some people I've talked to that haven't published their work but they're just sort of telling me telling me well you know an acute infection you can have like 25 percent of your alveolar macrophages coming from bowel have active HIV replication earlier published reports in the 80s said something like you know very very infrequent replication um, in alveolar macrophages, but then they're taking those alve alveolar macrophages out of people and inducing them with something, and they're seeing 80% of the alveolar macrophages show active replication. So it's really sort of all over the board and really needs to be explored better. Right, so talk about bystander macrophages in your, in your system here. Are you, are you able to, uh, how do you pipe them out? Are you able to like, sort of programmatically distance them, or are you just actually sort of looking at sort of averages and that and can that be partially explain at least some of the variability you're seeing in sort of your bystander, bystander macrophages and how the distance wise between you know, your co-infected ones. So they're pretty mixed. I mean, uh, so they're all in one culture. They're all mixed together. Um, so I'm not physically separating them or trying to do something like that. Um, we have thought about hypotheses sort of, I think, sort of where you're going about geography. If you're butted up against an HIV infected cell, are you more or less likely to have an effect of HIV? Um, we haven't done those sort of geography experiments yet, but I, I think it would be interesting to know if it is something like that or if it's a more generalizable effect. Bill Jacobs. Tracy, what was your source? Uh, I missed that. What was your source of your macrophages, and did you activate them? Um, so these are all blood-derived monocytes, and no, we did not add any activators. Just asking what happens. What do you, what, how do they naturally polarize, I suppose? Have you ever had no, uh, you know, we, I, I don't think anybody's ever shown that you can get TB to grow in an activated macrophage. I wondered if you had an HIV-infected uh, 
activated macrophages that would. Oh, ah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, we're hoping that we're going to do a full panel of sort of surface markers to get towards like canonical activation markers and non-canonical activation markers and try to, try to piece together these sorts of questions. Um, just to speak about when HIV evolves to be macrophage trope, it is a rapidly changing field. Uh, we've been looking at that quite a bit. We only find macrophage trope viruses in the brain or CSF late in disease, so and we almost never find them in the blood. So it makes me think that these are going to be like the X4 viruses that evolve late under conditions of immunodeficiency. They won't be a common. So we haven't looked in lung. If anyone has a lot of sputum samples with macrophages in them, uh, we can test them for the phenotype of a macrophage tropic virus, I think, with new, newer tools that are more accurate. But at least in the CNS, you don't see it until late, very late in the infection course. Yeah. Do you have a question? Over there, then. Go ahead. Have you uh, tried uh, culturing your macrophages with Maraviroc or other CCRFI inhibitors? And see if that has any impact. No, I haven't tried that. <laughs> So, uh, the second thing what Ron Swanstrom said, the, the issue of how prevalent macrophage tropism is amongst HIV variants is a, is a controversial and, and involving area. But if, if this is a feature that extends to bystander cells as well, or at least the vitamin D resistance, have you thought about taking, probably monocytes might not be the right source, but either monocyte-derived macrophages or tissues, say alveolar macrophages, from an HIV positive subject to see whether you can recapitulate the differences you see with primary cells from an infected individual. Yeah, we'd really love to do that. Um, and so I think really the only limitation that we have right now is time, but um, and also resources. How do you how do you get those resources? How do you get those cells? Um, so we're working. Yeah, I agree. It would be great to do it in alveolar cells. Okay. So you said that you had to stably infect them with HIV, so you waited like two weeks before you did the experiment. So have you changed that time at all to see if you had lower burdens of HIV to see how it changes your data? Or no, I'm not trying to change your experiment. No, no, no. Uh, no, I, um, I, I haven't tried to do that, but along that line, and that's research I didn't get, or analysis I didn't get to show you, was we haven't done that, but the one advantage we have with the single cell data is that we have the HIV burden per cell. So we can ask about the relationship between HIV burden and, and MTB burden. And we really, um, we're kind of surprised, I guess naively I thought that there would be some kind of relationship, and there's really not. And so we've, we kind of think that might hint to why um, there's still an increased risk of tuberculosis after you initiate antiretrovirals, because even if it's suppressing viral load or replication to a low level, you may still just have an increase, you, you terminally changed your macrophage, basically, to a permissive state. That's what we think, but we're, we'd love input on that hypothesis. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stop your microphone. Next is uh, <coughs> Roxana Rojas from uh, Case Western, who's going to talk about uh, the uh, uh, First of all, thank you very much to the organizers for putting together this wonderful meeting and uh, for giving me the opportunity to uh, present some preliminary results and some, some mm, a little bit older results. Um, so as many of you, of you here, I'm a, um, I have for many years uh, focused on tuberculosis research. However, in the past two years, I'm very much encouraged by uh, mentorship, collaboration, and funding offered through our institution and CIFAR. Um, I decided to expand my research interest to include uh, the study of uh, HIV and MTB um, pathogenic interactions. And our group is uh, right now, in the last couple of years, um, develop, developed two projects. One is uh, aimed at understanding how MTB increases HIV replication, and it has been funded through a CIFAR developmental award in 2011. And we propose that MTB molecules that escape from um, infected macrophages gain access to the extracellular compartment oops, 
and um, get in contact directly with these cells where they trigger HIV replication. Time permitting, I'm going to briefly summarize the results at the end of my talk. But today I want to focus a little bit more in very preliminary data that uh, we have obtained with, this, with our other project that is aimed at understanding how HIV increases the susceptibility to active and severe tuberculosis. And this project has been funded recently with a CIFAR supplement, um, and um, it's basically based on the idea that uh, HIV um, changes the function of the macrophage, as Tracy proposed, and th those changes in the dysfunction of the macrophage lead to increased MTV re replication or perhaps in increased MTV entry. So in order, in order to test the hypothesis, um, we are going to first identify macrophage genes required for mycobacteria entry and survival using a genome-wide shRNA screening approach that combines pooled antiviral shRNA libraries made by Selecta and made available to um, uh, academic researchers through this Decipher uh, project with next generation sequencing. In a second step, once we have identified the hits or the, or the genes involved, we are going to assess if these gene products are regulated directly or indirectly uh, by HIV infection. So very briefly, um, these uh, decipher libraries uh, are composed by three modules. Module one is the one that I'm, I'm going to show data about. It's a signaling pathway mo module. It contains 27,000 plus uh, shRNAs that target 5,000 mRNAs. And they have a high knockdown efficiency because they use five to six shRNAs per gene. Uh, very briefly, I'm not going to go into details, but um, these constructs have uh, a pyromycin resistant gene, an RFP tag that allows flow, flow sorting, and of course the shRNA component, <coughs> And very interest, interestingly, a barcode that is specific for each is shRNA, and it's a portion of the, the of the expression cassette that is actually amplified by PCR and detected by the sequencing. So uh, an overall um, view of the strategy is to first start with an homogeneous cell population, homogeneous, uh, um, which is in this case is THP1 cells. Um, that are transduced with the lentiviral particles that are very heterogeneous, each one containing a different shRNA, uh, in the conditions in which each cell uh, really take, take up one particle. Then the cells are selected with pyromycin, followed by flow sorting, uh, to obtain a population of 100% positive, SH, uh, sorry, 100% shRNA positive um, cells. After, after, we, after which uh, cells are uh, subjected to BC, <coughs> BCG infection, and this BCG is marked with, um, labeled with CFP, cyan fluorescent protein. Okay. And uh, for, for 20, the infection goes for, 20, for 24 hours, and the culture uh, proceeds for six days in order to develop uh, the phenotypes, infection phenotypes. Uh, one of the phenotypes is BCG positive cells, those cells that are permissive to infection, and a BCG negative uh, phenotype or cells that restrict or don't take up the bacteria. The BCG negative phenotype is, en is enriched by a second round of reinfection and reisolation. Then the DNA is purified, the barcodes are amplified by double PCR, and then sequenced by uh, Illumina system. And this is an example of one of the experiments, the polymer experiments, where we have a a, a, a population of cells that is 100% shRNA positive after six, six eggs of infection with BCG. Uh, these are the phenotypes we have. 35% of the cells are negative, so the rest are positive, and these cells are sorted by flow. And the two populations of, obtain again BCG positives and BCG negatives. The negatives are um, subjected to another round of uh, reinfection and reisolation, after which uh, we amplify the barcodes and um, sequence. And this is a very busy slide, but um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but only three points that I want to show. So this is um, the sequences of those, that uh, experiment I showed before. Sorry. In addition to sequence the BCG positives and the negatives, we sequence the um, uninfected cells. Does this work okay? <laughs> Does it? Okay. 
So as you can see, this uh, the Illumina system allows for um, a high number of reads. Uh, we are obtaining about 50 million reads, of which um, a, a good proportion pass the, the quality filter. So we end up with 14 to 35 million reads. Um, the interesting point about these samples is that while you have um, a range of frequencies between 6 and 8,000 in cells that are uninfected, um, and the, the, the range of frequencies increase uh, is wider from one to half a million in cells that uh, in that are subjected to selection. Uh, and this indicates that there's a certain degree of enrichment. Also, the distribution of the uh, frequencies is different. Uh, while it's normal in the uninfected, it's a little bit uh, more biased towards the left in the, um, in the selected populations. Um, so in order to analyze what were the differences in the, in the sequences, that we uh, detected in each uh, population, experimental population, we first uh, uh, normalized the sequence frequencies to 10 million reads. Th we selected those frequencies that were more than 5,000 in frequency, which is 2x of the maximum frequency in, in uninfected cells. And then we calculated the ratios of the frequencies between BCG positives and BCG negatives and vice versa. And as you can see in the bottom graphs, um, here is the VCG positive versus the negative. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of sequences, around 10 sequences that are enriched, about threefold, while in the VCG negatives, there's approximately 24 sequences that are enriched, um, at, uh, and the maximum enrichment is fivefold. So when we took a look, uh, a little bit a closer look at the those sequences that were enriched more than twofold in VCG negatives, we found those 24 sequences that um, when we searched the literature for some kind of uh, link to MTB infections, we found five sequences that have some type of, of, of relationship already established in the literature. And we picked two of those sequences, the serotonin receptor and, and uh, the serotonin receptor, just because um, recently it has been some evidence from, I don't know how strong, how scientifically strong the evidence is, but that um, some uh, serotonin receptor antagonists have anti-TB anti activity. Uh, and so um, this points to a role of this receptor in control of um, intracellular MTB growth. And the other is, is the BRAF5 um, gene, and this uh, gene is, of course, associated to phagosoma maturation uh, arrest. Uh, so this means that all these genes uh, identified here are associated with, or the silencing of the C, th these genes is associated with a cellular environment that um, is um, prone to MTB killing or less MTB uptake. So we also conducted a, a ingenuity pathway analysis of uh, the, the sequences we found, and um, interestingly enough, in the VCG negative cells, we found the infectious disease and antimicrobial responses 24 molecules of the network, um, and when you find several molecules in a network, it gives you a little bit more confidence that um, the results are more significant. Um, and also the main pathway uh, found was the interferon alpha beta signaling pathway, and it has been a recent publication on the role of, uh, on, on the, um, or recent findings by transcript, transcriptome analysis that these uh, genes are upregulated in active TB. The main network found in BCG positive was the cell development, growth, and proliferation, also 24 molecules in this network.